Hello, everyone. My name is Oleg Kagan, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with LA County Library, and I welcome you to Work Ready, Discover Your Career Path. And now I'd like to tell you about the Work Ready program. Work Ready started in December of 2020 with the purpose of helping people get a job, improve their work situation, and plan a more sustainable career path. We do that in two ways. One is we lend out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots for six-week loans out of 27 library locations all over LA County, breaking down one barrier to applying for jobs and getting online training. And two, we provide virtual events just like this one on a variety of work-related topics from the basics like resumes, cover letters, interviews, to deep dives into various careers and other subjects that help you succeed at work. For example, finding your career path. And you can see over 50 of those classes on our YouTube channel in the Working Career Playlist, which I will post in the chat right now at any time. Those were always be on there so you can review all of our past classes and soon you'll be able to review this one as well so if you're too busy you need to leave early you have an appointment or you're frantically taking notes and you're not able to capture everything that our speaker shares with you today have no fear you'll be able to watch this presentation later before we get on to today's presentation, I also want to let you know what we have coming up next week for, or sorry, in August for Work Ready. And that is on August 15th, Tuesday at 11 o'clock. We have help Work Ready helping recruiters help you. AJ Eckstein, who's the host of the Final Round podcast, has interviewed over 30 recruiters from various industries and has discovered ways to advance in the career interview process. You can hear his insights and ask your own questions to AJ on August 15th, Tuesday at 11 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and paste that in the chat as well so you can sign up and get a reminder. And again, that one will also be recorded. And if you're interested in other library programs, you can find out more about what we have to offer by going to lacountylibrary.org. On the top right hand side, click the events button. You'll see all of the events in person and virtual from 85 library locations for kids, teens, adults, older adults. And if you're just interested in virtual events like this one, you can find those by hovering over that events button. A little drop down will come up. So virtual, it says virtual programming. You click on that and it'll just give you our Zoom events. Also for all ages, all completely free and available to you. All right. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Armine Glikin is the assistant director at the, of undergraduate career education and development at the UCLA Career Center. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in counseling spe specializing in college counseling and student affairs, and a post-master's certificate in career education and counseling, all from Cal State University Northridge. Armine comes to us with nearly 10 years of experience helping people with career decisions, academic planning, and goal setting in one-on-one -on -one and, group set and group settings, having worked at numerous colleges, universities, including Cal State Northridge, Cal State LA, Pasadena City College, Cal Lutheran University, and of course, UCLA. Go Bruins. Her goal is to help you clarify your goals, make a plan, and learn practical tools and strategies to find a fulfilling career. And with that, I welcome Armine and bring her to the stage. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, welcome to Work Ready, Discover Your Career Path. My presentation today is going to be about uh, making effective career decisions and how to go about the career development process. 
you already heard a little bit about me, but a quick introduction. I did study at Cal State Northridge for undergrad and grad, uh, currently at UCLA, but I also currently freelance as a career counselor. My website is on the screen, careerrise.org. You're welcome to check out. I have free uh, resources on my website. I have paid resources on there as well. There's a newsletter that you can sign up for if you want to hear more from me. And I am passionate about all things career related, which is why I am on this journey and I'm here with you today. So the objectives of today's session. At the end of today's presentation, you will hopefully learn about the career development lifelong process, identify what gets you into flow state. We're gonna learn a little bit about flow state today. Gain clarity about your individual qualities that impact your career decisions, regardless of where you're at in the career development process. Obtain resources to help you move forward in your career development journey and gain confidence about your career choices. So when you hear the word career, I'm going to ask you all to participate with me a little bit in the chat. What comes to mind when you hear the word career? Go ahead and type your first reaction to this word in the chat. We got life's work, yes. Love that, that's, a, that's one I hadn't heard before. Jobs over a lifetime, employment, passion, job journey, fulfillment, something you retire from, a good and steady job. Excellent. We have a variety of answers. I see a lot of fulfilling work, which is great. That is ideally what you, how you want to feel in your career. I got fun. I love that. Yes, ideally your career should be fun. Um, so we'll learn a little bit today about how to identify a career path that will be fulfilling and be fun and be engaging for you. Before jumping into that, some technical definitions. I did see some people write like job and steady job in the chat. So wanted to differentiate job versus occupation versus career, especially for this presentation as we talk about these different things. Job is specific work done for monetary compensation. It may not always be fun or fulfilling, but it is something that gets you to meet your basic needs. Occupation is a particular line of work or set of jobs that a person um, th that is a person's usual work. So it could be multiple jobs that you uh, change within one industry. And then, of course, career is a combination of roles an individual has throughout their lifetime. It could be paid and unpaid roles, and it is that lifelong journey that many of you talked about in the chat. So as we think about jobs versus careers and our lifelong journey, we want to kind of go based off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you've heard of this, go ahead and put a thumbs up. Um, this is one of the foundational um, theories or concepts in psychology that kind of drives a lot of the things that we do as human beings. So if we look at this hierarchy of needs, there are five levels that are identified by psychologist Abraham Maslow. And he talked about fundamental needs, which are physiological, so air, food, shelter, and clothing. These need to be met before we can move on to the next level, which is safety. And you can see safety is about more security, employment, feeling stable, feeling, feeling healthy. Um, and then once those needs are met, then we move on to love and belonging, esteem, and then later self-actualization. And Maslow said that people cannot progress up, up the hierarchy unless the corresponding needs are met. And self-actualization does depend on having met underlying needs and looking outward to humankind. So thinking about once you're at that level, how can I make the world a better place? But we can't think like that if our needs aren't met yet, right? Because we are human beings. So with that said, as we think about job versus career, job is going to help meet your safety and physiological needs. So sometimes we might need to do a job that we don't love just to kind of meet those basic needs until we can get to ideally in our career, in that lifelong journey, when we are 
um, fulfilled and enjoying the work that we do, that's when we're reached, reached like self-actualization and esteem. So that's the goal of the career development process is to get you all to reach self-actualization. Some data and statistics to um, kind of give perspective for anybody who is maybe changing careers or um, changing occupations and uh, isn't sure, you know, where what their next step is going to be. I want you to know that you're not alone. If we look at the data, this is recent data in the last few years, 51% of US workers change jobs every one to five years. So if you are changing jobs, just know that you're not alone. More than half of the population in the US is on that same path. Six out of 10 millennials report that they are open to job hunting. That's just in 2022. Approximately 65% of US workers are actively searching for a new job at any given time. So the idea back uh, maybe about 40, 50 years ago, the world of work was very different. People would find a stable job and ideally stay in that job for uh, all through retirement, right? But the world of work has changed. That concept of staying loyal to one company is uh, over time, it, it's no longer popular just because people are looking for better opportunities, opportunities where they can grow, learn, and if a company isn't meeting those needs, they are open to, uh, at any given time, looking for a new opportunity. So know that that's actually a good thing in today's job market to be searching and looking for what, what else is out there that might be a better fit. And the average American employee holds 12 jobs throughout their lifetime with an average length of four years in each job. So 12 jobs, that's quite a bit. And those could be jobs that kind of uh, range in different industries. So you're jumping from one occupation to another. And this is all getting you to that fulfilling career, basically your career path that helps you grow and learn and develop as an individual. So career development is a lifelong process, as you all talked about in the chat. It involves continuous reflection and awareness. So we, can, we cannot do a lifelong process unless we're always learning, reflecting, and, and being self-aware. Uh, it involves seeking information and experiences. So even if you're in a job that you enjoy right now, thinking about you know, the next step is this, are there any other opportunities that might be a better fit? What other information do I need to learn and grow as a human being? Processing experiences to make sense of them with each new job, with each new experience, it's that processing, does this work for me? Who am I at this stage in my life? What are my values at this stage in my life? And processing those experiences and thinking about the lifestyle you want to have and the roles that you want to play in your life. So these all kind of encompass this, uh, the career development cycle. As you can see, this is a cycle. So there is no real beginning or end. However, it does generally start with exploring self. And this tends to happen for most people at uh, earlier on in life, but that's not always true. Everybody's path is different. Um, it could happen sometimes when, if somebody is going through like a midlife crisis, maybe they chose a career when they were younger um, based on what their parents expected of them or uh, based on financial security. But now they're going through, you know, after having worked in that industry for a few years, they're going through a little bit of a crisis and maybe they're just starting to explore themselves. Some people do this in college. Some people do this in their 30s. It just depends on everybody's own path. But it does generally start with exploring self. So I'll talk about what each of these phases mean in more detail in the upcoming slides. But um, as you can see, this is a lifelong cycle. So even if you go through the cycle one round and you find an occupation that maybe fits you at this stage in your life, it doesn't always mean that you're just going to stick to that occupation because you might get back to that self-exploration phase after a few years. There's actually some data out there that people change occupations um, about every five years. We call it like the five-year slump or maybe about seven-year slump meaning that about five to seven years into a work that into a job you might 
th start thinking about, okay, am I learning new things? Is this working for me? Who am I at this stage in my life? And going into that self-exploration phase that might lead you to changing to a different industry and that's okay. This is the whole career development cycle. So let's jump into each of these uh, phases. And as I talk about each phase, think about which one you might be in right now. I'm going to ask you to share in the chat as you kind of realize which, which of these phases you fall into. Okay, I'd love to hear from all of you. So exploring self, what does this mean? A lot of this is asking yourself the question, what problems do you want to solve in the world? So if you think about societal problems, um, think about whether it's environmental issues, uh, mental health issues, uh, child abuse, human trafficking, food insecurity, um, technology, and how that's changing humanity. Those are all relevant, and there are so many more relevant issues in society these days. So as you're thinking about what careers you, what career you want to pursue, what your life work is going to be, think about what problems do you want to help solve in the world. So let's talk about flow because this is one of the biggest aspects of the self-exploration phase. So a big part of self-awareness is knowing when you get into flow. I'm gonna ask you all to think about your uh, phase as well and when you get into flow. Flow state is a concept in positive psychology that describes a state of mind that occurs when a person is totally immersed in an activity. In this state, a person performing some kind of activity is fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment in the process of that activity. It can occur during a wide variety of tasks, such as when a person is learning, being creative, participating in a sport. Um, when in flow state, people pay no attention to distractions. So if you're doing something that you love, there's a little bit of a challenge, as you can see in the chart here, there has to be a little bit of difficulty to that task, but also as you're developing skills to get that task done, um, it makes you feel accomplished. It makes you feel capable. So a little bit of challenge, some skill sets, enjoyment, all come into uh, the formula for you to feel flow. And if you think about it, if you have felt flow before, usually you don't get distracted by anything. Time kind of stops for you. And if you ever think about if you've been in an activity where you're like, oh, how, how is it like three hours later already? I didn't realize how the time flew by. That means you were probably in flow. So think about this. We're gonna watch a video about flow in just a second. And then I want you all to kind of reflect on where you've been in flow. Let's make sure. If the volume doesn't work, please do let me know. Mihai Csikszent Mihai. And that's, by the way, how you say his name, dedicates a big part of the book to this idea that a person can make himself happy or miserable, regardless of what is actually happening outside, just by changing the contents of consciousness. And he goes on to quote Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Viktor Frankl. So this idea isn't something new. It's been around for millennia now. But recently, we've been able to gather more data on it. And I've talked about this idea ad nauseum by now, so I won't go into detail with it. I've talked about it in my videos about meditations and man's search for meaning and many other videos. But to touch on it briefly, people have this idea that if you just had a bigger house, you'd be happy. If you just had a nicer car, you'd be happy. If you just had a lot of money, you'd be happy. But that's just not how happiness works. Here's a graph adjusted for inflation that shows a period of about half a century where personal income tripled, but it didn't really affect how happy people were. After some basic point where your basic needs have been met, buying an even bigger house isn't the way to happiness. It's about changing the contents of your consciousness. So how can we change the contents of our consciousness? One of the best ways to do this is to put ourselves in a state of optimal experience called flow. Csikszentmihalyi describes flow as the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. 
He goes on to say that concentration is so intense that there is no attention left over to think about anything irrelevant or to worry about problems. Self-consciousness disappears and the sense of time becomes distorted. And you've probably experienced this before, and it's absolutely one of the best feelings in the world. If you're working on your business, you might be so focused on what you're doing that 12 hours might pass and you have no idea. All of a sudden, you look up and you realize you haven't had any food. You haven't thought about anything else. The only thing that you could focus on was your business. And the same thing applies to so many other activities, whether you're a rock climber focused on climbing your new record or a master pianist composing your new masterpiece. It's an amazing feeling. You're so immersed into what you love doing, into what you're really good at, that your brain simply can't focus on other things. You're not worrying about stupid things. You're not regretting what you did yesterday or stressing about what you'll do tomorrow. It's absolutely one of the best feelings in the world. So if we look at the flow diagram, here's how you put yourself in the state of flow. You don't want what you're doing to be too challenging, otherwise you'll have anxiety. You don't want what you're doing to be too easy for your skills either, otherwise you'll be bored. But it's when you balance these two that you end up in the flow channel. You're striving towards the upper right corner constantly. You increase your challenge, you get better. You get better, you increase your challenge. And the more you move toward that direction, the more intense the state of flow gets. So this is not really a how-to book, but our goal should be to find what it is that we love and then keep getting better at it and keep making it more challenging. Or in other words, the main goal is to spend as much of your life as you possibly can in the state of flow because that is where you find this unbelievable ecstasy. And Csikszentmihalyi gives an example of the Indians in the Shushwap region of Canada who would settle down in a place filled with resources and life was good and they had everything they needed. They had all the food and fish where they were, but the elders would make sure that the entire village would just pack up and move to a new location every 25 or 30 years. This way they knew they would have new places to explore and hunt and fish and new challenges to overcome. And it's a great story to keep in mind when you think about how most people just want to settle down in front of their TV for the rest of their lives. And in a lot of my videos, I criticize being in front of the TV all night or spending your entire day on your Facebook feed. And I often get people who tell me, well, what if that makes the person happy? And the answer is sitting on Facebook all day will not make anyone genuinely happy. If you pick a person who spends his entire day in front of the TV, he's probably not going to be the most exciting, happy, ecstatic person. So let's take a look at the graph again. Looking at your Facebook all day or watching TV puts you in the lower left corner of the graph, which is known as the area of apathy. There's no challenge involved. There's no skill involved. You're apathetic. And when you're not completely apathetic, you're probably sitting there bored or worrying about everything there is to worry about. So move away from that. Move away from the boredom, apathy, and worry, and move towards ecstasy, which is what you'll experience when you hit the state of optimal experience called flow. All right. So now that we've learned a little bit about flow, I want you all to take some time to think about what activities get you into flow. So if we think about these different areas in our life, academics, work, social, and hobbies. Take a moment, jot, jot down maybe if you felt flow in multiple of these areas, or at least hopefully one of these areas. And then once you have your answer, please go ahead and type it in the chat, um, what activity it is that has gotten you into flow. I'd love to hear from all of you. Writing books, thank you, Sandra. Working with people, cooking. Oh, I love that. I do enjoy cooking as well. Writing. Doesn't mean I'm good at it and could have a career out of it. Though, if it is something you wanna pursue, you can definitely develop the skill set, right? And as we saw in the chat, in the chart, the more you do the activity, the more you develop the skill set, and then you increase the level of challenge. And, and so on and so forth. So that is something that can be pursued if you decided you wanted to go that route. Excellent. Some people are talking about exercise, reading, designing, 
Working on cars, I love that. Working with computers and with people, singing along with my friends as a group, that's amazing. And then assisting others. There's a lot of variety in your answer, starting a new business. That's amazing. So thinking about these things, this might be a little bit of an answer to your career questions. Maybe you want to listen to these um specific areas of your life a little bit more. Pay more attention to when you are feeling flow. What is it about these activities that makes you feel flow? And from there, maybe that could be a little bit of an insight into what might be your fulfilling career. And you can decide to keep these as hobbies as well. But if we're wanting fulfilling, fun, engaging career paths, this is the best way to kind of start that process, right? Um, so as we think about self-exploration, what gets you into flow? What problems do you want to solve in the world? What are activities that make you feel engaged? Um, those are questions you want to ask yourself, but also you can think about what interests you have, what skills you have, what values you have. Values is a big part of self-exploration in the career development process. What is important to you as a human being when you think about the kind of lifestyle you want to live, the kind of impact you want to have in the world? What is important to you? Because that uh, usually uh, many of our values stay the same throughout our lifetime. Some will change, but some are really core values that will stay the same. So think about if travel is a core value, maybe you want to have a career that enables travel. If having a family is a core value, then maybe you want to have a career that's going to allow you to also have time for a family and so on. So these values are also really important. Now you see some uh, different logos on the screen. These are different um, assessments or activities you can do online to help you clarify some of these things like interests, values, personality, skills, um, which are really core standard things to think about in the career development process. So I'm gonna put some um, links in the chat for you all to these different websites. My next move is on ONET. 16 personalities helps you identify your, it's an assessment that helps you identify your personalities. And so is Truity. Both of those are about um, personality. My next move is about interests. So give me one second. I'm going to type them in the chat for you. I have to stop share for that. But these links, um, when you have some time, if you are interested in taking an assessment, they are completely free and actually very valid. Okay. So as you explore yourself, take some assessments, think about the things we talked about today. The next phase is exploring pathways. So let's say you have some clarity. You're like, you know what, Armine, I know myself. I know what, what, what makes me engaged, what interests me, what values I have. So the next step is what do I, what do, I do with this information? So exploring pathways is actually exploring different occupations, different uh, career paths, different industries to see what might be a good fit for you. Because there's so many different industries out there these days, and it keeps changing. Honestly, it keeps changing with technology. There's so many jobs out there these days that didn't exist before due to technology and vice versa, jobs that no longer exist because technology is advancing. And with the introduction of AI, it's going to change even more drastically in the next few years. So it's really important to kind of keep up to date as to what's happening in the world of work so that you can you can make an informed decision, right? So how do you explore pathways? Job shadowing. Job shadowing is a great way to learn about what is out there. So what job shadowing is, is if you find somebody in your network who is doing the work that you wanna do, or at least uh, the work that you're considering doing. Some of you talked about writing books. Some of you talked about working on cars. Find somebody who is actually doing this for a living as a career path and shadow them for a day. Um, ask them if you can shadow them. Usually most people are open to that. 
shout out them for a day, see what it's like to actually be in the shoes of that person, at least for one day, be in that environment. What is it like to be a writer? What is it like to work in an office setting? Um, this exposure is going to help you see the reality of what the work is like, because you could read all, of, all about it online. There are lots of great websites, which I'm going to share with you. You could read all about it online, but it's not the same as until you're in the same space, seeing what the work is like on the day to day, because no job, even if it's your most fun, fulfilling, engaging career path, there's still going to be things that are maybe challenging or things that you don't love doing. It's never 100%, and that's the reality of it. And I can say, speak from my personal experience, too. I absolutely love what I do as a career counselor, as an academic counselor, love helping people, guiding and impacting people. But working in an office setting also has its challenges. And um, when you're making a career decision, you want to think about what are your non-negotiables. It's kind of like a relationship. I always use this um, example. It's like a relationship. What are your non-negotiables and what are things that you are willing to maybe compromise on? Same goes for your career. So with mine too, I have found things that I don't love about it, but I'm willing to compromise because I love the overall work that I do. So that, that's the reality of it. And, the, and you want to have that realistic perspective when you're making a career decision. So job shadowing is a great way to actually see what the reality is like. The same goes for experiential learning. So experiential learning is putting yourself in that space as an intern, as a volunteer, maybe as a paid entry level employee in that kind of work setting. Sometimes it's harder to get a paid job if you don't have the experience in that field yet. But to get the experience, you could start off as an intern or volunteer. And I know that that might not always be an option if you are, of course, needing to like talking about the Maslow's, of hier Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you need to make money to survive. Um, so it might not always be an option to have an unpaid gig, but if you are willing to maybe on top of your current paid job, wanting to explore a different industry, maybe setting aside a couple hours a week, it doesn't have to be 40 hours a week, it could be like three or four hours a week, you go twice a week to that work setting as an intern or volunteer and experience it and see what it's like on the reality. Plus it gets you some experience in that field. So depending on your personal situations, where you're at in your life and your career development process, you might need to uh, step out of that comfort zone and put yourself in a situation where you're doing an unpaid gig just for a while to get the experience and see, confirm if this is the field for you. Plus it gets you to network with people in the industry, which is super important. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. The other way to explore pathways is informational interviews. If you haven't heard of these, these are great ways to learn about the industry and network with people. So informational interview is finding somebody who's doing the work you want to do. And this could be somebody who's currently in your network. Maybe if you think about a friend of a friend, your neighbor's cousin, something like that. Or it could be somebody who is you find online. We're going to talk about LinkedIn and such in a second. Um, if you find somebody online on LinkedIn, for example, you can reach out to them and let them know you're interested in the work that they're doing and ask if they have 15, 20 minutes for a, maybe a video call or a phone, phone call or a coffee chat to talk to them about what it is that they do and um, how they got there and what um, opportunities there are in that field and maybe their perspective on what they think, how they enjoy the work that they do. So it gets you to learn about it from real people who are experiencing it from firsthand. And it also expands your network in the industry that you want to go into. So these are all active steps that we all have to take as we're exploring different pathways. These are really great websites for exploring pathways. So ONET online, and I'll, I'll put these at the end because I have to stop sharing my screen. So I'll put these at the end in the chat for you, the link to the direct website. But the Employment Development Department is a great um, website to learn about accurate information about different industries. So you could type in a job title, type in um, any kind of job title that you're interested in, and it will give you like current salary information, job outlook. So is there an increase or a decrease in the field? Um, 
and how to become one, how to get to that career path. Same goes for ONET. ONET gets a lot of its information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So ONET also has really great accurate st statistics and data on different job titles. Career One Stop has um, some activities that you can do as well as learn about different industries. So, uh, US Bureau of Labor Statistics um, actually is very similar to EDD and ONET. And then California Career Zone is also interesting. It has other like interests and personality activities, but it also has like a salary activity that you can do if you maybe want to kind of determine, okay, this is the salary I need to sustain a lifestyle that I want. And then based on that salary, whatever um, comes up in that activity, it will give you occupations that it recommends that actually meet those salary requirements that you have. So all of these kind of have a similar purpose, but uh, some of them have different activities on there that might be interesting to engage in. But these are great ways to learn about pathways that it maybe you can start with reading up on different industries on these websites, but then you wanna go into the other activities we talked about, informational interviews, job shadowing, experiential learning, to take action that goes beyond just reading about it on the website. Okay, and as we think about our network, I talked about your network a little bit uh, when we were talking about informational interviews. Think about your network. Networking is crucial to any kind of career development. There is some data out there that 85% of jobs are found through networking. Even these days with all the job search websites we have online, all the different resources, you know, back in the day when um, technology didn't exist, People were going into offices and asking for jobs or looking, looking it up in the newspaper. Those were their two main options, right? These days, we have so many websites, but even though we have those websites, networking still remains to be one of the most popular ways to find a job. So as much as it might be a little outside of our comfort zone, usually my clients, people I'm working with, share that it's, it's not the most natural or comfortable experience to build a network but it can be, it's a skill that can be developed. And that's something we could work on together too if you needed some guidance on that one-on-one. -on -one. But networking is cr crucial in any career development process. So thinking about as you are maybe looking for people that you could do informational interviews or job shadowing with, think about your network. And there's this concept um, called the six degrees of separation. So you, the person you might want to meet with, like the owner of a business, the CEO of a company, that person is likely to be six people away from you, generally speaking, meaning it could be your neighbors, cousins, friends, aunts, friends, nail technician, something like that. That's six people away from you. That could be the person that you need to talk to, to learn about the industry you're interested in. So the more you share with the people in your life, the things you're interested in, the more likely it is that you could get closer to these people that you need to talk to because your neighbor might think, oh yeah, so-and-so is interested in writing a book. So-and-so is interested in creating a business plan. So if, if it ever comes up in conversation, you could be on their mind and you could be referred. But people need to know this about you. They need to see your excitement, your, your authenticity in the work that you want to do. Otherwise, nobody will know. And if there's an opportunity that somebody hears about, they would never be never think of you because they're not sure what you're interested in, right? So it's really important as you're thinking about your network to also share, share with the people in your life what you're interested in. Okay, this is all one process of exploring pathways, doing the online research, building your network, sharing with the people around you, and um, putting yourself in those work settings to see the reality of the field. So that's exploring pathways. The next step, let's say you go through all that process, the next step is trying out opportunities. So we did talk a little bit about that already. So we'll talk about trying out opportunities and building a portfolio. Some things you can do um, besides the internships and the unpaid work is actually sign up for online courses for skill development. So let's say you are interested in something but you don't know if you have the skill yet. 
um, someone talked about designing or things like that. So maybe it's a matter of taking a course. Maybe you don't, maybe you're not in a place right now in your life to go back to a full academic program, go, go back to school like full time, right? But maybe um, if you're not in that space right now, maybe you could take an online class on LinkedIn Learning or Coursera. So I know that these are actually free access to you because you have a library card. So you can get, um, we can easily get access to LinkedIn Learning and Coursera. Um, I have a link to these as well that I will put in the chat, but if Oleg also wants to share with you how you can access these through the library, um, he can also share with you that as well. But LinkedIn Learning and Coursera are great places where you could take short-term courses, modules, um, online modules at your own time, self-paced that you could use to develop skill sets. Perfect, I'll like put the link in the chat. Thank you so much. You could follow tutorials on YouTube. There are a lot of great um, videos on YouTube for skill development as well. Attend workshops like the one you're doing now. So you're already on the right track with, with the, the step that you're taking today. Um, apply your skills to a personal project. It doesn't even have to be with a particular company or for a job. It could just be a project that you do freelance. And you could actually put that on your resume as experience. It counts because if you're learning a skill, you're trying it out as a personal project, you're developing further in that skill, it counts as experience. So that is something that could go on your resume. And then community service and internships and unpaid experiences. We talked about these are some great websites here on the slide. Idealist.org has really great nonprofit organizations on there that you can look into. Nonprofits, a lot of you talked about in the chat, helping people, working with people. Nonprofits are a great way to get started on that. So idealist.org, I would encourage you to check out, but there's also internships.com. And then on my website, careerrise.org, I have some job search engines listed on my homepage. Some of them are divided by specific industries and others are more general, but I vetted through them and I, I, I approve. I have put the green check mark on there. So um, you can check out some of those job search websites on my website as well, okay? These are great ways to try out different opportunities um, as you start thinking about building your portfolio. So portfolio building is also super critical because now we're getting into your personal brand. So it's, let's say, you know, you're, you're clear about who you are, what you're interested in. You've done the networking, you've done the exploration, you've researched different industries. You've come to an idea. You're like, this is what I want to pursue. And this is um, what's important to me. And you have some experience, right? Whether it's paid, unpaid, that's irrelevant. You have some experience in the field. Now it's time to brand yourself because now you're gonna be out there maybe applying to jobs or, or if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to get clients, things like that, right? So now you have to brand yourself. These are the ways to do that. So one is building a resume. How many of you are confident with your resume right now? You, you think it's amazing. You think it, it will get you an interview if you apply to a job with that resume. You could um, either raise hand feature or put a thumbs up in the chat if you're confident. I got it could use improvement. Thank you. I got one thumbs up. I think mine is an old person's version. <laughs> Love that. You know, resumes are constantly changing as well. So not that it's an old person's version, but it, it, it could be that maybe it's a little bit outdated because literally every couple of years, there's new trends in resumes. I got a seven out of 10. I thought it was having trouble getting an interview. Yeah, um, that happens often too. A lot of folks um, that I work with think that their resume is really well developed. And then when we look at it together, there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen. I'm confused what best format for resume right now. Yeah. So anyone who has resume questions, I'm happy to actually work with you one-on-one -on, -one on those. I do have a resume course on my website as well. But with that said, oh, someone talked about AI's resumes are so hard having to appeal to AI instead of people. Yeah. And we can talk about that. Those are skills that I can teach you how to actually tailor your resume so that um, it could pass the AI software. 
But with that said, resume building is a critical part of your portfolio because that's the first impression that most jobs are going to get from you, right? They, they haven't had a chance to see you or talk to you yet. So your resume is all they could go based off of. So there's a lot of tips and tricks uh, when it comes to resumes to really appeal to the AI and then get, get your resume to the person in front of their eyes. Um, things that I'm happy to help you all out on as well. But resume is just one part of the portfolio building. The other part is how you interact with people, like we talked about sharing with your network, the things you're interested in, how you talk about your yourself, your skills, your interests. Those are things too that kind of go with your personal brand. And then LinkedIn. How many of you have a LinkedIn account? About one person, two, three. Okay, it needs to be updated, but I have one. Okay, a few handful of you have one. Those who don't, I would highly encourage you to have a LinkedIn. Those who have one, want to update it. Again, something it can help you with. But LinkedIn is also a really important aspect of your portfolio because when you apply to a job, I think the data was like over 90% of recruiters are looking on your LinkedIn or Googling you to see what comes up. So if you've never Googled yourself, Google your name and see what comes up. If there's anything from the web that needs to be deleted, do that as uh, before you apply to any jobs, any photos, um, it, it could be harmless, but if it's something that maybe doesn't present the best version of yourself, still it's important to kind of be cautious of what comes up when you Google your name. I would highly encourage you all to do that. But with that said, LinkedIn is another platform that recruiters or employers are going to go on to see, learn about you as they look at your resume. So it's also a really important factor in the career development process. All right. So as you try out opportunities, you build that network, you talk to people, you build your portfolio. The next step is going out there and doing the work, right? You go through the cycle. This usually is not a very quick cycle. It takes, um, it could take a couple of years to kind of go through the entire process, especially the self-exploration could be a really, um, it could be a journey on its own to go through self-exploration, right? Um, once you have clarity there, trying out, exploring, learning about different industries takes time on its own until you find opportunities, you go through that, those, that process, you gain the skills, gain the experience. That's, that's also a little bit of a time consuming process. Once you have that, then you build your materials. And that's something that you could work with a career coach for, or if you're in school, your school would have a career center that you could go to as well, likely. But um, I am happy to help anyone with the building portfolio process or any of the other processes in this cycle. Once you go through that, you go out there and you perform. You do the work and you see how you feel. It might be your dream job, or it might be something that, you know, within five to seven years later, you go back to that cycle and you're like, is this still working for me or do I need to make changes? Either way, it's totally natural and totally okay. As you saw, most people are shifting jobs and careers throughout their lifetime. But I want to hear from you all now that we've talked about all the different phases of this cycle. Where do you all think you are? Which phase do you feel like you're in right now at this time? You could just type the name of the phase in the chat for me. Exploring self, pathways, self, pathways, exploring pathways, all of them love that. Exploring pathways, exploring self, yeah. Okay, career change and exploration. So most of you are in the phase one and two, really exploring self and pathways, which kind of go hand in hand. Sometimes you have to like go out there and explore the pathway so you can also then assess whether it works for you and your values. So it's they're, they're two in one sometimes too, depending on how you're going about the process. Finding what makes me feel flow, that will also be a stable career, which is exploring self, yeah. Okay, majority of you are in the first couple of phases, which is great. Um, 
I'm happy to help anyone if you need one-on-one -on -one services for these, but also there's other resources on my website, some of the free resources that kind of help guide you in your reflection process. So you're welcome to check out those resources on my website as well, but also the other websites that I sent you in the chat. I'm gonna send you the rest of the websites that I talked about after the presentation um, in the chat, but I'm glad that you all kind of realized which phase you're in and now you have resources to help you with kind of moving forward in that phase. Okay. How are we all feeling? Does anyone have any questions, any concerns about anything we talked about today? And please do direct your questions in the Q&A box. Actually, Armin, I, I have a question because I know that a lot of people are interested. You mentioned earlier that you had some advice for um, getting through the, uh, the, the kind of tra applicant tracking systems mm -hmm. um, when people submit their resumes to different companies. Um, can you give some advice about that? Yeah, definitely. So a big part of that is tailoring your resume. So I always work with resumes kind of backwards. So I'll say, let's look at the job description. So it has to be tailored specifically to the individual job description. We pull the job description. We look, we look at keywords from what it is that they're looking for. What are the specific qualifications, knowledge, and skills they are asking for in that job description? Usually I go through a process of like, I print it out. I start highlighting, underlining, keywords that I see that they're asking for. Then we go to your resume and we start looking at your resume, which experiences throughout your entire lifetime. I see some people have over 40 years of work experience. Others might be just starting off uh, regardless. Throughout your entire lifetime, where did you get these skills and knowledge that they're asking for? And that's what goes on your resume. And then we format it um, according to today's standards and we categorize your experiences too. So we don't just do everything in their one experience section, but we categorize based on different types of skills. So, so a lot of job descriptions will have some kind of like people, um, customer service or uh, like a teamwork, those types of skills. And then on top of that, other skills that they're looking for. So we'll categorize like, do you have any kind of people, teamwork, customer service experience? That will be one category. Then we'll do the other categories based on what it's looking for. What AIs do, they're called applicant tracking systems. They will just read your resume and see how many percent of the keywords match the job description. So if we're using the same keywords they're using in the job description, then you're likely to bypass the system because it's going to see that you have maybe like 90% match or something like that. But we have to be honest. I will never encourage... Uh, being dishonest on your resume and writing skills that you don't have. So we still have to be honest, but there is a way we could use this same terminology and categorize your resume so it could be targeted to that job. Sounds good, thank you. And somebody had asked, how do they set up an appointment with you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say you could go onto my website. There's a contact uh, tab, um, type in a message in that contact page, and then I will receive it and get back to you. Career and wise, thank you. And I'll post that information all in the follow-up, including the, the links you put into the chat. I'll put all them in the follow-up email. So if anybody missed those in the chat or wouldn't be able to copy those out, don't worry, you'll you'll receive all those. You'll rest easy. Yeah. All right, so let's see. How do you find jobs that your skills match? Speaking of websites. Um, um, yeah, so that that's kind of going to be the whole process we talked about today, whether it's looking online, whether it's um, looking at what other people are doing in your environment. We could start with what skills do you have? Maybe you write down on a blank sheet of paper the, the skills that you have that you feel like are something that you're wanting to promote right now. And then based off of that, we could go into those job search engines or look into your network and see what are different opportunities. Kind of have to keep your eyes open. But in the job search websites too, you could filter by like different industries. A lot of them have like an entry level filter that you could put if you're entry level status um, just to see what, what um, entry level things come up. But a little secret, 
you don't have to meet 100% of the job requirements either. I always say, if you're at 85%, you feel like you meet the job requirements, take a risk and apply. Because a lot of times you can learn on the job and most employers want people who are willing to learn on the job anyway. So, you know, if you're overall confident, but there's like one or two bullet points on there that you're not sure that you can do, take a risk and apply to that job. Uh, do you have any suggestions on tailoring resumes when you have to when you have more transferable skills than the ones they're directly asking for? Yeah. So yes, those transferable skills are still very, very relevant and important. So it would be the same process I talked about with reverse looking at the job description and then categorizing your resume. But if there are industry specific skills they're asking for, that's where LinkedIn Learning and Coursera are going to be your best bet because you could find just about a course on just about any topic on those websites. So if there's something technical, some kind of software program or something specific that they're asking of you, go onto those websites and see if they have a course on that. At least you could get an introduction. You're not going to become an expert with one course, but you can get an introduction to what it is they're asking for. And then you can actually put that on your resume as like basic knowledge, basic skill level. At least you know what they're asking for. And then when you're on the job, you can learn further. And there was a question, uh, a pretty specific, but do you, do you have any good YouTube tutorial recommendations for IT positions? Ooh, that's very specific. I actually don't. I'm happy to look them up. If you want to um, put in my website on my contact page, type in your question for me. I could maybe do some of that research and send you recommendations. That's like a question we get at the library sometimes. Yeah. Because I, I, would, I, I would think, I mean, it really depends on the area of IT that they're trying to go in. But I would say, like what you said earlier, YouTube it has a lot of different options. There's many, many different tutorials. Uh, quite a lot of them are also out of date and by people that may not have the expertise that actually is, is required or useful for creating good tutorial. A lot of pretty low quality tutorials out there. So I would say if you know the skill that you're interested in with regards to IT, LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, other, you know, multi, uh, you know, other online learning platforms um, will be a better bet because then you know who's teaching the course. Um, and you, so you know it's going to be of a certain quality. Definitely. Yeah, you, you type in like IT positioned into YouTube and you're going to get like a, a thousand results and you have to sort through those to find and you're going to watch them and go, okay, this one's not good, but you've already watched it for 20 minutes um, to determine that. So save yourself the time and go to good sources right away. Yeah, great point. Uh, next question is, what skills do you think are needed in jobs today and in the future? Yeah, so actually, that's a great question. The NACE competencies, it's called the National um, um, uh, Colleges, National Association of Colleges and Employers, the uh, NACE, that's their acronym. That company, that association has, skills that they specifically have outlined that employers are looking for in today's society. So some of them off the top of my head are um, self-awareness or career aware awareness, critical thinking, communication, technology skills. Those are, those are the four that are coming to my mind. There are about three more. There's about seven of them. Um, but technology is very popular these days communication, critical thinking. Oh, diversity and equity is another popular one that is on the NACE um, website. So what NACE does is they interview or research, survey um, employers every couple of years to see what are companies looking for. And that's how they come up with the skills. So they update it every couple of years. The most recent one has those skills on there. So I would recommend, I'll put um, specifically the acronym in the chat. If you want to Google NACE, you can learn more about what they do um, and, and those skills on their website. And I'm going to include that also in the follow-up email. All right, let's see. Uh, here's a question. This is a really good question. Um, how does one find balance between livable wage and the money one earns and a career that brings one joy or fulfillment? The, yeah. the perennial question, I think, in, in your line of work, I'm going to Great question. I will have to say that's a very individual process and something that kind of each person makes 
makes a decision on their own. So it goes back to like, what is it that you're willing to sacrifice on? Sometimes I work with clients who say, no, salary is the number one most important value for me right now. So they might sacrifice a little bit of that enjoyment because they want the higher salary and vice versa. So it's going to depend on your specific scenario and how much importance you put on fulfillment and enjoyment in your work and how much importance you put on salary. Um, but you could also look at current living situations in wherever you're living um, in, in your county, in your, in your state, the salary that you need. So, and then do a calculation like that and do a reverse calculation, see what it is that you need to make to be able to at least live in that space in that same area that you're in. Um, and then from there, the website that I talked about, which was Career One Stop, has those um, has like a list of occupations that meet the salary requirements you're asking for. So you could do that process, but I would say it's a very individual decision that each person makes as to what they're willing to compromise on. Do you think shadowing would be welcome if you're an older, over 60 person? I do. I think anything is possible um, because these days, uh, career, the world of work is, is, is shifted so much that, you know, it's very common for people to be making career changes at an older age. And so I do think, yeah, and depending on um, the other individual on the other end of that conversation, uh, I think it's very possible. People are usually more open these days to like allowing others to explore, learn, and grow, regardless of age and where you're at in your lifetime. In the library, uh, it's oftentimes people's second or third career librarianship. So people come in at over 40, 50, 60. So yeah, in our field, it wouldn't be wouldn't be that odd at all. Um, if somebody emailed at age 60 going, I'm interested in getting into a librarianship. How do I do it? And I'm sure there are other careers that are like that as well. Yeah, definitely. Let's see. What format or layout do you recommend for resumes? Yeah. So the, the most common one is reverse chronological. So your most recent on top. But um, like I talked about earlier with categories, you don't want to just do reverse chronological and list all the experiences you have in order. You want to categorize by skill area. And then within each category, you do reverse chronological, most recent on top. I hope that helps. All right, and then I have a question here. How do you include interpersonal skills, um, i.e. soft skills on your resume? And just, this is our last question. So if anybody has other questions, um, you know, put go ahead and put them into the chat right now because um, we only have time for maybe a, a couple of more questions. So here, the, I'm just gonna repeat this question. How do you include interpersonal skills or soft skills on your resume? Sure, I don't recommend putting them under a skill section. I do recommend embedding them into your bullet points. So when you talk about your past experiences, your jobs, your, your internships, things like that, you're gonna do bullet points saying like the different things you did in that job, right? In that, those bullet points is where you can embed. So let's say the, inner the soft skill is like interpersonal or teamwork. You talk about how you worked in a team in that job embedded into the bullet points using those keywords. That's the best way because if you just list it under a skill section, it doesn't really prove that you have the skill. Anyone can say they're good at teamwork or communication. But if you talk about it in a bullet point, say, this is how I worked with the team, then that's gonna be proof that you have the skill. Sounds good. How do you handle large gaps in employment on a resume? Yeah, um, so, Ideally, we want to try to cover up the large gaps if possible. So thinking about what are things you might have done during that time. Sometimes it's like if you've done community service, if you've done any personal projects, freelance work, if you've done any online like courses, online learning modules, things like that, those could be a great way to fill those gaps. So it's not as obvious on the resume that there was a gap because you were still learning and growing regardless. Even if you didn't have a full-time paid job, you were still doing things. If you didn't have any of those experiences, I know sometimes people take time off to, for their families to take care of a loved one or things like that. That 
uh, can actually go on a resume too, if relevant for the industry that you're working or you're applying to. Sometimes people will put like homemaker or something along those lines on a resume and talk about this, all the skills. You know, if you're managing a family, you're managing a family budget, you're taking care of loved ones, that those are transferable skills that can go on a resume if appropriate for the job you're applying to as well. All right, so um, I think these are the, the final questions we're going to take here. So here's a quick one. How many bullet points should you list for each position you had? Average is three to five. Um, you could go a little bit more if it was a really hefty position, like six or seven, but I probably wouldn't go over that. All right, and then um, how do you know when you, this is actually two questions in one. Um, how do you know when you have found a feasible next career while going through an exploration? And then the other, the other question from this person, but actually this is a totally separate question. How do you judge whether you're going into a hostile workplace? So let's do the first one. How, how do you know when you found a feasible next career? Yeah, um, if it meets some of the standards you've set for yourself, right? Whether it's like salary standards, lifestyle standards, or if it's uh, if it's a position that allows you to learn and grow in a particular skill set, particular industry, that could be feasible for the next step. It kind of depends on what you're looking for and what what your goal is, your long-term goal. So if it's something that gets you closer to that long-term goal, then it's probably feasible as a next step. I would say probably one, like the best way to judge is, am I learning or growing in this position? Sounds good. And then the next question is, how do you judge whether you are going into a hostile workplace? The everybody's nightmare when it comes to applying for jobs. Really challenging. I mean, you know, the, the majority of, involvement you have exposure you have before you accept the job offer is their interview so it's kind of trying to see if there's any red flags during the interview process like if they say we we need you right away it's or you know things like that that could mean that maybe the work is really overwhelming there's a lot of high turnover that's why they're they're needing somebody right away because people just like flat left the job you know um that could be a red flag but a great way to kind of assess is also ask people who work in the company. So as you're in the application process, let's say as you submit an application, you can look for people who work at that company on LinkedIn and, and connect, send a connection request and then send them a message and say, I'm really interested in this position. I already went ahead and applied. I was wondering if you had some time to um, chat about your experience with this company. Uh, and and you probably won't want to ask flat out if you do get to talk talk to these folks flat out any questions that that might be super um, direct you don't want to get anyone in trouble either. But as you have a conversation with them, you can gauge: do they seem happy? Do they seem like they love the working environment? I've had a conversation with someone I I talked to who worked at a position I was applying to, and she had she said it was like the best place she's ever worked at you know I didn't ask any direct questions but the way she was talking about the company you could just tell that she loved it so it could be if you reach out to folks who work there that's a really really great way to get insight otherwise pay attention to red flags in the interview like urgency like um, how they interact with you over email when they're scheduling your interview if if anything seems off um, unprofessional those are those are things that are red flags I know I've heard of websites like Glassdoor. What do you think about websites like that, like with reviews from people about places they've worked or places they currently work? Yeah, Glassdoor is very legitimate. I would encourage that. Thank you for reminding me about that. Glassdoor um, is great. I think you you can do like a, you create create an account and then you can see all of the different um, uh, reviews on companies. So, you know, you also want to take that with a grain of salt, just like any other review. If you're looking on Yelp, there's always going to be like some negative ones for, but you could look at if there's a pattern. So if most people are saying something good about that company on Glassdoor, but there's like one or two negative comments, then you can, you can maybe that person had a, a bad experience, but overall you want to look at the theme. Yeah. Sounds good. And then the, here's the final question. Um, this person is coming from a 14 year run as a stay at home mom. Um, is she at a, or, yeah, is she at a disadvantage with no LinkedIn, et cetera? Actually, I want to, I want to, so we have this question, but, but I, what I really, uh, I think would be an interesting answer in addition to just the base question is, 
where does this person go from here? Like, how do they build out their network? You know, what, how do they overcome whatever perceived or disadvantage they had in 14 years of staying at home? Yeah, yeah. I would say it's all about perspective. Um, if you want to kind of spin it into, uh, like I talked about earlier, there's a lot of skills that come from being a stay at home mom, we could spin that on a resume. So no, I don't think you're at a disadvantage. But I do think that having a LinkedIn and having those um like, you know, being being available online, having an updated portfolio is going to be important. So with it, specifically to your question about LinkedIn, yes, I do think that having a LinkedIn is actually important. But I don't think you're at a disadvantage for having been a stay-at-home mom for 14 years because that doesn't mean you haven't grown in those 14 years. So that's what the whole perspective is in your portfolio is how have you grown in that time. In terms of your question, what are next steps that this person can take? Um, I mean, I'm going to refer back to the cycle we talked about today. Depends on where you feel like you're in the cycle. If you're in the self-exploration phase of the cycle, then we start with step one. Figure out where are you right now? What's important to you? What's of value to you right now? And then we go from there. Um, but it's probably going to be kind of a combination of self-exploration, but also learning about what's out there in the world of work at the same time, building your resume, building your portfolio. But it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It could be step-by-step -step process, which I am happy to help with as well. Sounds great. Armin, a, thank you so much for sharing your hard-won experiences um, over, with over a decade of work in career counseling. So this was a lot of really good information and um, we'll be sharing the PowerPoint so people can can look into it, can learn can learn more, a lot of the websites in the follow-up email. And I do have a post events survey that I'm gonna post in the chat right now. So if anybody is willing to take a few minutes to let us know how you felt about the program, we use the survey responses to craft future programs. So here's a link to that and it should also open up when we finish the program. And again, thank you. You are Mene, and thank you all for being here, asking your great questions, and we hope to see you at our next Work Ready program. Until next time.